I want to appreciate God for yet another opportunity to be in the presence of the Most High even this day. I want to thank God for the grace he has given unto me uh, to receive this from him. Uh, I keep on saying it. It is not just by my power. It is far from being by my strength. It is just the Lord's doing. And honestly, it is still marvelous in my eyes. I still cannot phantom how he does what he does. But I want to say glory, honor, and adoration be unto him for his faithfulness and his goodness to the sons of man. I mean, to, to his children. This day, we are still going further in the training. Uh, what I had planned that we are going to do today, but the Holy Spirit is uh, giving me some other, has ordered me to do some other things. Uh, first, I want us to bow our heads as we pray. Father, we want to say thank you. King of glory, we appreciate you. And we say you are worthy, Father, to be praised and to be glorified. We are baffled and we marvel at your work, at the things you do, and the ways you do the things you do. Glory be to your name, Lord, in the name of Jesus. This day, we have come unto you and we ask, Lord, that you will expose your minds unto us and you cause us, Lord, to understand that which you want us to do. There's a destination you are taking us to. We pray this day that each and every one of us and every sphere we get to that destination so that the world will be turned around for your own glory, Lord. Thank you, blessed Redeemer, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. I want to appreciate our dear leader, Reverend Ruth Lawrence. I want to appreciate everyone that has committed herself or himself to this know how I nourish time. I want to say I appreciate you because it is something I have not been able to get myself to do. Uh, and I can see that there are some people who have been faithful right from the first day up to now. May the Lord reward your efforts in Jesus' name. I want to appreciate in no small measure our dear mamas, the 12 women who have committed themselves completely to the work of God, whose obedience has brought us to this level. I pray that the Lord will continuously guide and help them and strengthen them in all areas in Jesus' name. Uh, last week, we tried to look at types of projects and we look at how projects are classified. And we saw what projects look like in the secular world, and we brought ourselves to understand specifically what projects are in the willing women move. We tried as much as possible to identify uh, the factors that govern or the factors that determine projects in GTA willing women. We understood that it is not uh, philanthropic, it is not man, but the initiator of GTA projects uh, is just one person. 
and we identify that one person as the God who created the heavens and the earth, who also walked and uh, who was the first executor of projects and whose projects we are all. Uh, there was something I was to mention last week. I remember that we mentioned the fact that projects can be multifaceted. That's one project can have different faces. And we actually agreed that it would be important to uh, face projects, I mean, to let projects have faces. We also understood the fact that there could be projects inside projects. Projects inside projects, like the project of Nehemiah, the bigger project was the building of uh, the, the the renovation, the building of the I mean, the gates of Jerusalem, the walls and the gates of Jerusalem that were in ruins. But we saw that within carrying out that project, he also carried out a few other projects. Like we understood that as he was carrying out that project, he noticed oppression and he corrected it. He also noticed wrong marriages, mixed multitudes, impurity in the lineage of Israel. And he also did what? He made sure it was corrected. Uh, today, I was in my heart, until maybe one or two hours ago, I was preparing so that we can talk about the, some terminologies in project, that is projects and those who are involved in it and the things that are expected, the expectation, the milestones, the deliverables and all those ones. We'll still get to them, but the God of heaven, the Holy Spirit ministered to me that we should go back to the basis. And what is the basis? The basis is that projects are groanings in God's heart, which echo in the hearts of man and is translated into activities, which brings transformation. And as I uh, some, I think two hours ago, as I decided to read over the few things I've written, because I'll continue to say it very soon. Uh, the, the, those who are authorities, or at least those who have uh, spent time and money to read about management, will be coming to teach us some things that are actually academic, which can be linked to spiritual. But for now, <laughs> you, will just, uh, uh, you will just tolerate and excuse my shallow knowledge of what project is and just accept what the Holy Spirit is actually talking about. And so the Holy Spirit says, we should look again are the groanings and the echoes. I, I want us to always bear in mind that whether it is no our nourish, whether it is a uh, testimony time, whatever we do or training time like we are going through or sphere uh, activities, whatever we do in GTA, one A is transformation. And one key thing is that God has given it to us as a project that the kingdom of this world will become his kingdom and that he will reign and reign. The key is that it will become the kingdom of God and of his Christ and that he will reign. So the aim of God is transformation. And so every project aims at transformation. Today, I, what the Holy Spirit is saying I should do, and we are going to do a few discussions because I believe that in the last one week, some other people have got groanings and 
it is already echoing in their hearts and they want a way out. We want to thank our dear leader, Reverend Ruth, who has already created uh, a platform for echo. If there is an echo in your heart, you already have a, pro a program, I mean, a platform where this echo will be incubated. And as it is incubated, it will be translated into, uh, I mean, activities or projects and then you can go and expand it in your various sphere. But today, God is saying we should talk about. So let me not forget that projects can. That is what I forgot to mention last week. That project can be long time or short time. Project can be long time projects, and project can also be short time projects. It depends on what God wants to achieve and the uh, scope of the project. We'll be getting to scope of project very soon. But now, this money, God is saying that he wants, he wants, to, he wants us to understand how to identify his groanings. How to do what? Identify his groanings. How do you identify? Because I think uh, from what the what I understood from what the Holy Spirit is saying this morning to me was the fact that there are groanings and there are echoes in the hearts of people, but some people do not know how to identify God's groanings or uh, and how to know what an echo is in their hearts. And so I want us to read from the book of John, the book of John chapter 11. And I want us to start reading from verse 31. And let's read through to 37. It's a common story that we all know, but we want to identify a few things from that story. When the Jews who were sitting with her in the house and consoling her saw her hastily, Mary had arisen and gone out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to pour out her grief there. When Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she dropped down at the street, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her sobbing, and the Jews who came with her also sobbing, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. He shouted in spirit and sighed and was disturbed. And he said, where have you laid? He said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. The Jews said, See how tenderly he loved him. For some of them said, Could not he who opened a blind man's eyes have prevented this man from dying? Now Jesus, again signing repeatedly and deeply disquieted, approached the two. It was a cave, a hole in the rock, and a boulder lay against the entrance to close it. Jesus said, take away the stone, Martha, the sister of the dead man, exclaimed, but Lord, by this time he is decaying and thrown off an offensive odor, for he has been dead for this. Praise the Lord. Uh, we will read on and read on, but we all know that story. It is the story of the death of Lazarus and how Jesus brought him back to life. Uh, we want to uh, identify how, I mean, we want to identify groanings in the hearts of God, or how do we know that God is groaning over a particular thing? And what echo does he have in our minds. 
So I titled Factors That Can Enhance Identifying or Identification of God's Groaning. Factors That Can Enhance the Identification of God's Groaning. Perhaps there's a groaning in the heart of God, but you have not been able to identify it. That's what God is saying. The Holy Spirit is saying that we should learn or we should be able to identify when there's a groan in the heart of God. The passage that has just been read to us is a passage about the groanings in the heart of God. It's a project that was carried out. If we read and read on, we will discover that or if we start from verse 28, we would have discovered one thing, that Lazarus had been sick, Jesus had been contacted, but Jesus went about doing his own things. Was it that Jesus did not care? No, it wasn't that. Now, when eventually he came to town, from that place we started reading, Mary stayed out. Why did, he, why did she haste out? She wanted to go and meet the Lord Jesus Christ. At, as at that time, Mary was not expecting Lazarus to be brought back to life. It was just like expressing her sorrow before a friend, before somebody who has been very close to the family, before somebody whom she, she understood we understand the depth of their sorrow. That was all she wanted to do. This is somebody who has been a friend in the family. This person will understand the depth of our sorrow. So she was going to, I mean, talk to that person. And in talking to that person, she could not just talk. She fell down. And what did she do? She wept. She was weeping. The people that were with her were also weeping. They were sobbing, according to the script, I mean, the version that was read to us. They were crying. The Lord Jesus Christ had a groan in his heart. The Lord Jesus Christ had a groan in his heart. And I want to tell you that the groaning in the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ was the groaning in the heart of God. And what was it aiming at? That's one thing I want us to understand this morning. What was that groaning aiming at? It was not aiming at just bringing Jesus back to life. It was aiming at bringing glory unto God. It was aiming at what? Bringing glory unto God. It was aiming at winning souls for God. It was aiming at showing the power of God. Just showing who God is. And so in the process, what happened? We are talking of factors that can enhance identification of God's groaning. And the first one that I want us to understand this morning is you can identify God's groaning first and foremost by consistent prayer. By what? Consistent prayer. When, for example, you are consistently praying about a matter or you are consistently praying for a people, a nation, a group of people, an individual, God begins to give you insights into such people's lives or such nations, you begin to have insight into what is going on. Why was Mary contacting Jesus? Why did Mary have to leave uh, uh, where other people were sitting with him money? Why did she uh, forget about those people and left that place? It was because there is somebody or there was somebody who understood them better by relationship. 
Praise the Lord. There was somebody who understood them better by relationship. The type of relationship they had had with Jesus, the type of teachings she, he had done with them, the things they have shared together made Mary to understand the fact that this person will understand our sorrows better. Even if, he, he, she, like I said, Mary was not thinking of Jesus, of Lazarus being raised back to life. Because you understand that even when they said, oh, even when Jesus said, ah, uh, it is for us. He said, no, no, no. I know that there is restoration after that. But what I'm saying is that my brother is gone. So they were not looking for resurrection. They were not looking for, they were not thinking of uh, Lazarus being brought back to life, but they are looking to discuss with somebody that has a relationship with them. Praise the Lord. So you cannot be able to identify God's groaning without a relationship with God. So there must be a cordial relationship with God. As I said, prayer is very, very important. There must be a cordial relationship with God, a relationship that is not just one that you hurry over. Then there must be a consistent and persistent prayer for maybe a people, a nation, a group of people, a sphere, before you can begin to be able to identify the groanings of God in your heart. So consistent prayer, consistently sitting in the in the in the in the in, in, in the presence of God will be a solution to understanding the groanings of God and then identify identifying the echoes in your heart. If there is no relationship between you and God, and there is no relationship between you and a group of people, it will be difficult to identify the groanings of God concerning such people. Praise the Lord. You remember the seraphim, I mean, the 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 the, the woman who uh who came to the prophets and complained of his, her children who were about to be taken away. If there was no relationship between uh, 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 the prophets and the husband of that woman, it will not be easy for the woman to come to the prophet. It is because a relationship had already been created. So relationship with God in the place of prayer, relationship with people also in the place of prayer helps us to identify God's groaning concerning a people. Praise the Lord. It is very, very important that we consistently pray. You might be praying for days, for years, there may be nobody, but one time the Lord will begin to create in your heart. You know, you begin to hear the echoes of the groanings of God in your heart concerning something, and then you identify it. These things, they don't just jump from at me. They don't just jump on you. There are things or there are factors that identify them. Another factor that is very important in the issue of identifying the, the groanings of God as echoes in our hearts is our ability to be, I mean, ability to be sensitive. I mean, it's, let me just put it this way, observations and sensitivity in the spirit. Observations and sensitivities in the spirit is very, 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 very important. Praise the Lord. If we are not very observant and we are not sensitive in the spirit, we will not be able to understand the groanings of God, not to talk about how it is echoing in our hearts. Everything will look normal. You walk on the streets, and while you are walking on that street, you will see nothing but the beautiful houses 
the one that food does. Oh, this, this one. You will just ident I mean, you will just see those beautiful things. You will not be able to understand the things that are there. One day, I just want to give an example of myself. One day, we are taking normal walk with some of my children. And there was this beautiful house in one, I mean, that we came across. And I exclaimed, oh, I like this house. Just see the way it is done. Oh, God, this is very beautiful. Mm, this is super. That was me talking. Because I was just looking at the beauty of the house. Because I, I wasn't sensitive. I was just looking at the beauty of that house. Then I had my sons. My son said, mm, Mommy, do you know? Have you seen something? I said, no. He said, look very well. He said, can you see one? I don't know how to call it now. It's like a plant, but it's built into the house. Golden, shiny. He said, can you see that beautiful golden? Uh, something? I said, oh, it's true. He said, mommy, I said, yes. He said, it is for a particular cult. I, I exclaimed, eh? He said, yes. He said, mommy, I, I, I didn't know you don't know. He said, whenever you see this, it is a particular cult. He said, then the color you are seeing in this house is the color of identification of that particular cult. He said, we can Google it when we get to the house. I was, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't even talk of how I felt. What am I trying to say? Observations and being sensitive in the spirit. It's not all the things we see. Since then, I learned to look at some things in total and if possible, find meaning to it. Very recently, very, very recently, I think two or three days ago, I was looking at a work that uh, uh, some me, a group of people in my sphere, we are working on LGBTQ plus, and uh, they made their first dra draft and they sent it to me. And I, I sat down to look at a few things in that first draft. Draft, and I saw so many symbols, so many symbols that you can just go to the market and look at it and say, oh, "This will fit my my grandson. Oh, this will be good on my granddaughter. Ah, this looks quick. This looks fine." And you will not know that you are already putting the badge, the symbol of identification of those people on your something. So, ident I mean, being sensitive in the spirit. And then, have you, been, have you been in a gathering where people are jumping up, particularly in the church? Let me be very factual. You find people jumping up, shouting, right on, preacher, oh! The praise and worship is so fine. If you are sensitive in the spirit, you find a caution in your heart. And while people are shouting, you find tears dropping. What is happening? God is groaning and it is echoing in your heart. At that time, what you need to do is to get home and say, God, all right there, begin to ask God, God, what is wrong? What, why are the praises not unto you? What do you want to do? Who is at fault? What must be corrected? So being observant and being very sensitive in the spirit will help us to identify the groanings in the heart of God. That house that I was talking about was built by somebody because interest now made me to look at, to look for who is the owner of that house. And by the special grace of God, in my little way, I began to pray. That house today is still there when I pass through that place but it's in desolation. Praise the Lord. 
So that is one way of identifying the, 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 the groanings in the heart of God. Another way that you can identify the groanings in the heart of God is by gathering information. It is important that we gather information. If Nehemiah, whom we have been using as a case study, just greeted those people who came to town, oh, how are you? I mean, became very hospitable. Bring them food, bring them drink. Oh, they jolly together. And then I'm tired. I've walked throughout the day. You will never have been able to know that there is a God, there is a groaning in the heart of God. You will never have been able to know that there is distress. So we have to learn to gather information. In fact, the Lord was speaking. Was let me not uh, exaggerate matter. I was looking at some things after the week of the family's fair week. And God, I began to understand that this LGBTQ plus, many of us, we really don't have deep understanding. We really don't have enough information about them. We really don't understand their, the, the, their modus of uh, operation. We really don't have understanding of their history. We really don't even know what they are aiming at. You know, it is like we just have little, little information. And I processed it in my heart and I began to look at it. And I said, look, it's going to be one of our projects this year. And I made, I mean, we call the global meeting of our, of our sphere the family sphere, and we decided that we are going to work on LGBT, LGBTQ+. And it is not something that one person can do. A group of people had decided, they volunteered, that they are going to work on it. I discussed it with uh, our dear leader, Reverend Ruth Lawrence. I said, yes, I even have somebody who can also be part of it. And so we are working on it. We are not just working on it for the family sphere. We are working on it, getting sufficient information about them. And as the Lord will permit us, we want to make sure that we bring this thing out so that everyone in every sphere, we identify how LGBTQ plus is affecting his I mean, their own sphere and can now stand and walk against it. Because I understood by the Spirit of God that it is, it is, even though I don't know much about it, but I understood that it is the root of so many things we are seeing in the society today, so many vices we are seeing in the society, so many evils that have been perpetrated in the society. And until we are able to tackle it, we may just be cutting the shoot and the root may still be on the, I mean, in the ground. And as soon as water con I mean, contacts it, it will again shoot out. But this time around, we want to tackle it by uprooting it. How do you uproot? You must have sufficient information. So gathering information, no information is, is irrelevant. You sit, when you have the time, you listen to your national news, and then you pick an information. You listen to some discussions, you pick an information. You are with some people, you pick an information. And as you pick these pieces of information and you process it in your heart, you begin to know that God made you to hear that particular information because there's something he wants to do about it. I want to say that let us be open-minded. You know, there used to be a time 
that our national news in my nation is all about politics and is is all about I mean, exonerating a particular political group, you know, praising them, you know, false stories and all those things. And so if you want to put on the channel for the national news, I say, no, 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 no. I don't want to hear anything about it. what will they say more than to do this or more than to do this one. But now I can understand that even when you hear their falsehood, it can be a way of knowing the truth and what to pray about. So we must learn to gather information. Uh, the issue of how to gather information, uh, the Lord will help us to treat it. How to gather relevant information is another thing that the Holy Spirit is just dropping in my heart, that we also need to know how to gather relevant information so that we don't become busybodies, so that we, be, we don't just go about. So God will help us to know how to gather relevant information. By the special grace of God, we'll be looking at that later. Another way that you can understand the groanings in the heart of God and that it can echo in your heart is by empathizing and sympathizing with people. The spirit, you must, all of us must pray for the spirit of compassion. We need to pray for the spirit of compassion. If we don't empathize, if we don't sympathize with people, we may not be able to understand the groanings in the heart of God concerning such people. Praise the Lord. There are some things that happen. And we just look as human beings. And we say it is their carelessness. It is because they did this. Until we begin to understand very, very importantly that compassion is a virtue that every child of God should develop, should have. Compassion is a virtue. And when you want to, when you have the spirit of conversion, compassion, you don't judge. Praise the Lord. If we are quick to judge, we will miss God's groanings. I don't know if somebody is agreeing with me this day, that if you are quick to judge, you are likely to miss the groanings of God in the heart of, in your, in your heart. You will miss it. Because for everything that happens, there will be an explanation. There will be somebody that is careless somewhere. There will be somebody that did not do it as it's supposed to be done. You must first have that spirit of compassion if you are going to be able to understand the groanings. What made Jesus to embark on the project of bringing Lazarus back to life? It is compassion. Compassion for Mary. Compassion for Martha. The way they were crying. The way people follow them. In fact, some people were making, 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 uh, me, me reference this one that he has been their friend and is opening people's eyes. Can he not raise this man? They were becoming a subject of mockery. It has become a, a, a situation where people will ask them, What did you gain from hosting Jesus all the days you have been hosting him? What was your gain? Yet your brother was sick. You even sent for him. He did not come. He came now. He could not do anything. Can you see yourself? So compassion is very important. Brethren, if we have compassion, if we are not quick to judge, if you see, you can never be able to help uh, 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 strict, strict children. I'm just using them as an example. If you love to judge their parents, you will not be able to uh, get into doing some projects for some people, maybe teenage pregnancies. I don't know why God is bringing these things to my heart. Maybe teenage, teenage pregnancies. You see so many teenagers drop out of school, drop out of this one, getting pregnant. If you are quick to judge them, 
Eh, hey, it is their parents. Eh, hey, they didn't do this. They were sent to school. See, this is what fits you. If you are the type that knows what fits man by the standard of the world, you will not be able to have compassion in your heart and you will not be able to understand what God's groaning is about those children. If you are the type that believes that ah, a turbulent marriage cannot be endured, just get out of it. Like I read in the papers. I read everywhere. I hear people. People even give counsel. Say if your marriage is becoming, life is more important. You will not be able. So compassion is very, very important. You have to sympathize with the people. It is when your compassion gets to a level. It prompts you to pray. And then God begins to show you his groanings. Then you begin to hear what others are not hearing, ringing in your heart. And then you can translate this into something. If you are not compassionate, you will not think of bringing out the poor for poverty. Because you will always find an excuse of the fact that they are lazy, they did not do what they are supposed to do, or they did not go to school, they did not do this one. But if you have compassion, you will understand that what they have missed, God can still help you to supply it. So that is one. Then your passion. Your passion. If you don't have a passion, you can't have a groaning. You can never have an echo of God's groaning in your heart if you are not passionate about something. I keep on, there's a statement that keeps on ringing in my ears every day of my life. And what is that something? It is that if you have not spent a cause you can die for, you are not fit to live. If you have not discovered a cause you can die for, you are not fit to live. So your passion, your passion is very, very important. When you are passionate about a thing, you can quickly identify what is paining God about that thing you are passionate about. You can quickly understand what God wants about that group, about that thing. Are you passionate about the youth? You will see, so if your passion is for the youth, you will see so many things wrong. You will hear the, the echoes of God's groaning will be so loud in your heart for a particular season, for a particular thing at a particular season. So your passion is very, 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 very important. What are you passionate about? That is one thing you must identify. Are you a minister of God? You must have a passion. Are you in the willing women move? You must have a passion. It is by your passion that the groanings of God can be understood in your heart. If you don't have a passion, then everything goes. You will discover that if, if there is a groaning, it will fade away easily. Praise the Lord. If you don't have a passion, it, you, you cannot have a groan. And if, if you, by accident, Maybe you gather some information and because of that, you begin to think of it will fade the way easily. But when you are passionate about a thing and then you gather information about it, you will quickly be able to identify the groanings of God and the echoes in your heart. And you will not be able to do away with it. You will continue to incubate it until it is translated into activities and then lives are transformed. So your passion is very, very important. Praise the Lord. Another important factor is your vision. Is your vision. And when I talk about vision, I'm talking about your vision as a Christian. Your vision as a Christian. You know? See, talking about, I mean, permit me to Talk of the fact that uh, 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 Paul, he said, is the least of all the apostles. But by the grace of God, he did so much, more than even the apostles he met. What helped him? He had a vision. And what was his vision? His vision was simply the salvation 
of the Gentiles and the redemption of the Israelites. The salvation of the Gentiles and the redemption of the Israelites. To the extent that when you go to in the book of Romans chapter, chapter 10, verse 1, he began to talk. He said he wished he could die. He could be caused so that his people, Israelites, the Israelites can be redeemed because his, their redemption was his vision. So if you don't, if, if you don't know where you are going, every way will look as if it is right. When you see somebody who misses road, somebody is going to a particular destination or does not know a destination, every way you suggest to him will look very right. But when you have a destination at heart, you will be able to seep out those, I mean, roads that will not lead to your destination. But when you don't have a specific destination at heart, every road leads to everywhere, and everywhere is nowhere. And so you can't have a groaning, even if you do, even if it echoes in your heart, you can't make a thing out of it. You must have a vision. I must have a vision. We must be visionary. We must understand what God is given to us to pursue. If we don't understand what God is given to us to pursue, we will just go about doing everything and at the end of the day, achieving nothing. So there must be a specific destination. There must be a goal in your heart before you can understand the groanings of God, before it can produce echoes in your heart. Another thing that I think will help you in identifying the groanings of God and translating them, I mean, identifying God's groaning, having the echoes in your heart and translating them into activities is your ability. If you understand what the book of Ephesians chapter two, verse 10 says that we are God's workmanship. We are created for that purpose. So you will understand that whatever you have, that's why I said your ability. Maybe I can put it better as your talent. Maybe I can put it better as your endowment. What are the things you are endowed with? What are your talents? What are the gifts you have? If you understand your giftings, if you understand the, the talents you have, if you know your endowment, all this put together will help you to identify the groanings of God. Look, God does not groan in the same way to everybody. He will, you will, the, the echoes of God's groaning in your heart will be according to the measure of the talents, the gifts, and the endowment he has endowed you with. It will not give to you. It will not bring an echo in your heart that you cannot translate into activities. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name to identify God's echoes in our hearts. I want to say again that before we leave, we are going to look at, uh, like I said, our dear leader, my friend and my sister, uh, Reverend Ruth Lawrence has created uh, a platform where we could prayerfully incubate the echoes of God in the heart of man so that it can be translated into activities and then you can be released into your spheres. In this way, every sphere will benefit. Let us not rush into what to do. 
let us incubate these echoes and get God's leadings as to what to do. Let them be specific, I mean, fully incubated and hatched according to the will and the purpose of God. Father, I want to say thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for the multiplication. Thank you, Lord, for the people you are adding. Thank you for the echoes, your echoes in the heart of man. Thank you, Lord, because you are prepared to touch the world. Thank you, Lord, because even after today, many of us who have not been able to identify what are the echoes in our hearts, by passion, by compassion, by information, by sensitivity, by prayer. Father, we will understand them more. And Father, even by next week, this group will be expanded to the glory of your name. Thank you for this once, Lord, because this echo will ring stronger and they will not miss the incubation period and the hatching will be by you and unto your glory. Thank you, King of glory, for in Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen, amen, and amen.